and that's a bingo. Is that the way you say it? That's a bingo. You just say bingo. Bingo! How fun! How fun indeed it is, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Short Story Bingo. Get a soul clap in on that. My name is Nature Come the Third. If this is your first time, welcome. If not, the retention program is working. What I do on this podcast is I'm a glorified narrator to stories that you have heard and some that you have not. It's like Libro.fm, sort of. Uh, thank you guys for your support and listening. Uh, please visit the YouTube and subscribe there. We started uh, last week was the first episode of the R series po- um, portion of the podcast with uh, Brandon Harris. He's the CEO of Jaws Size. Got that right here. Thank you so much to him and his staff for making that happen. We certainly appreciate it. Uh, today, we're going to be reading um, a chapter out of The Black Klansman, right here, which is, uh, of course, now a major motion picture, but uh, the story of Ron Stallworth and him being a Colorado Springs, uh, being in the Colorado Springs with the police department and um, famously infiltrating uh, their uh, Ku Klux Klan uh team or like their group out in Colorado Springs back in the 70s but nonetheless before we get started make sure that we uh, give our ode to our sponsors this episode of the podcast is in fact sponsored by extraterrestrial media extra t media visit their film and music if you need to film a vi- music video record an audio single or get a drone shot of your business or home need consultation for a project and much more visit extra they have a range of services to help any of your media needs we're also partnered with libro.fm when you make the switch enter story bingo at checkout for your new membership to receive two audiobook credits instead of one libro.fm makes it possible for you to buy audiobooks through your local bookstore giving you the power to keep money within your local economy create local jobs and make a difference in your community which is very lovely whether you're paying for a monthly membership Giving an audiobook to a friend or buying an audiobook for your organization, Libra.fm splits the profits from your purchases with your local bookstore. And of course, here at Short Story Bingo, um, I am leaked through the King's English Bookshop, which is on 1511 South, 1500 East in Salt Lake City, Utah. Visit kingsenglish.com. Uh, Short Story Bingo is also partnered with, as mentioned, Jaws or Size. Brandon Harris and his team have created an innovative product that works over 40 muscles in your face. Just released a new line with mint flavoring, uh, the Total Transformation Pack, right here. Um, We'll ensure you see the results that you're looking for. Visit jawsersize.com and at checkout, enter Story Bingo for 60% off your order. That's right, I said 60% off your entire order make sure also please like follow subscribe share all that shit on twitter and instagram at short story bingo um and at gabino underscore grimes uh, i'm your fucking host so that's what it is <laughs> uh so with that in tow um again very excited for what we got going on man and uh how things have been panning out uh certainly appreciate all the support that we've had and uh, we're just gonna keep this rolling, man. So having a good time doing it, um, and you know, no intention of stopping with where it's at now. We're doing two stories a month, and then two, two R stories a month, with which makes it so much more um, easy to you know manage uh, from my perspective to make sure that you guys are getting the content that uh, you know I want to make sure gets out there. <laughs> Um, either how, again, my name is Nate Chacon the Third. Uh, check out um, my new album, Darby Hentz, GabinoGrimes.com for all the new merch you can see right here. This is a Ragtown hat. And yeah, man, let's get into it. Short Story Bingo, episode 63, Black Klansman, a memoir from Ron Stallworth. We're going to get into it. Peace. Short story bingo. Short story bingo. Short story bingo. Short story bingo. Sometimes they're funny and sometimes they're sad. Most of the time they're funny because I hate to be sad. Short story bingo. Short story bingo. Short story bingo. Short story bingo. But don't take my word for it. Spare fingers. Yes.
All right, all right, all right. Let's get this going. Woo wee! Perfect. Perfect. All right. I'm gonna give a an idea of what this book is for those that haven't read it or seen the movie. Um, again, Black Klansman, um, which was uh, done by uh, it's a Spike Lee joint, you know. So let's read a little bit about what uh, you know. We're gonna read the the chapter is uh, chapter four. It's called My New Friend David, but. Um, yeah, to get an idea of what we're actually going to be reading about is right here. So, when Ron Stallworth, the first black detective in the history of the Colorado Springs Police Department, comes across a classified ad in the local paper recruiting for the Ku Klux Klan, he responds with interest, using his real name while posing as a white man, which he says within the book was like rule number one that he fucking broke. <laughs> Uh, that decision launches what is surely one of the most audacious and incredible undercover investigations in history. Detective Stallworth sabotages cross burnings, exposes white supremacists in the military, and even fools David Duke himself, which we're going to talk about. Black Klansman is an amazing real-life account that reads like a crime thriller, thriller, one that offers a searing portrait of a divided America and the heroic citizens who dared to fight back. Black Klansman... Chapter 4, My New Friend David, memoir by Ron Starworth. All right. So to set it up, um, he had already spoke with uh, one of the Ku Klux Klan members in, in uh, Colorado Springs. They had invited him to uh, meet uh, their group. And so um, Chapter 4 is going into that wait and then actually meeting them. And so that's how we jump into this story. And again, he used his real name, so he had to have someone else... Uh, go there um, that looked like, or that was, you know, that was white in order to make it happen, which, you know, take that for what it's worth. All right. Our wait wasn't long. 10 minutes after our arriving at the quick inn, a truck pulled up and the weird looking hippie with a Fu Manchu mustache we'd been waiting for got out. He walked over to Chuck's car and tapped on the window. You run. He asked. Yes, said Chuck. I'm Butch. Of course, your name's Butch. <laughs> Here to take you to Ken, who's at another location. Come on, get in my car and I'll take you to him. As with any undercover meeting, it's imperative that the UC, which is undercover operative, do everything he can to maintain control of events to the best of his ability. This is essential not only for his own personal safety and the overall success of the operation, but also for the benefit of the surveillance officers, whose primary responsibility is to provide backup for him in the event the situation breaks down and threatens his personal well-being. With this in mind, recognizing that he was wired for sound and also had a handheld police radio in his unmarked undercover car, Chuck put up the best fight he could. How about I follow you in my car? Chuck asked. No. Nah. That's not how this is going to work. You're going to leave your car here and I'll take you to Ken. Well, where are you taking me? You'll see. Which fucking you'll see, you know, is like those famous words like you'll see. And then boom, someone's dead or something. <laughs> Chuck finally relented and got into Butch's, Butch's truck. I, I would only, I wouldn't even say relented. I'd say he'd be like, okay, fucking, then that's what we're doing. As he entered... Chuck glanced in the direction where Jimmy and I were parked. So like looking back and like, yeah, I guess I got to go, you know, follow me. Because the wireless body transmitter is a one-way device, transmit not received, we could hear Chuck but could not transmit messages to him. He did not even know if the transmitter was working, though we had tested it after affixing it to his body prior to leaving the office for this meeting. It wasn't uncommon for these devices to have unexpected breakdowns. I mean, it's electronics, you know, and it's, I think, I believe this is the 70s. So like, how far do you know that things are working? So I get that sometimes in the middle of an undercover operation. Can you imagine that? Just like being in the truck outside and like, ah, oh, we lost him. And that happens in those movies. You know, we lost him. We lost him. And then they pull up a fucking, uh, like I think of NCIS and they pull up that screen. That means nothing. And because they're acting that's like against a green screen. So they're just like moving their hands and in post they, they mess with it. But like, we lost him. We lost him. 
<laughs> As with any such operation, the UC often function in a sort of eerie darkness, devoid of knowledge as to whether the transmitter was operating properly and the surveillance was able to clearly hear his conversation or whether they had any knowledge as to his whereabouts when, as in this instance, he was moving from one location to another with any foreknowledge. As it turned out, our concerns were unwarranted as Butch drove about a mile and a half to a popular hangout for the local adult crowd, especially the area's military personnel. The Corner Pocket Lounge. Uh, new name for a dive bar. A real dive bar with a neon sign, frayed pool tables, and cheap beer. I later learned that the lounge was the unofficial recruitment point for Ken and his Ku Klux Klan cohorts. Jimmy and, I, Jimmy and I parked just outside the bar and radioed to surrounding officers our location. Fortunately, on this occasion, the body transmission, uh, transmitter was working flawlessly. Chuck was greeted by Ken, a short, about 5'9", easy, I'm fucking 5'10", that's, you know, stocky, approximately 220 pounds. Again, I feel like that's a personal attack, I'm about the same. Man, about 28 years of age, with brown haircut, military length and a slight mustache. With him was a younger man, approximately 20, who Butch introduced as his younger brother, Baron. Believing he was talking to me, Ken told Chuck, I've been impressed talking to you over the telephone. I feel you have some fine ideas that could possibly help the cause. He then showed Chuck a packet of papers, which he said had all of the necessary information Chuck would need if he decided to join the cause that's what they named it was the cause because they couldn't like just openly say you know he proceeded into an explanation as to his motivation for joining the Klu ku klux klan anybody ever fuck that up Klu klux klan i've done that so i've done that more often than not like be like oh it's the Klu klux klan it's the ku klux klan the clan according to ken became his salvation Ugh, have to find new salvations if that's the type after he had once been shot by some N-words. <laughs> this is going to get great. And his wife had been raped by several of them. Damn, dog. His prejudices towards N-words, he said, had really, been, uh, had really begun after he joined the U.S. Army. Have you been reading the publicity the Klan has been receiving in all the papers? Ken asked Chuck. Chuck replied, yes. Though he admitted he probably had missed some of the articles on occasion. Go on, I don't fucking, you know, tell me a little bit more about it. Ken went on to explain that he and other Klansmen have been placing these articles calling journalists. The Klan was making its presence known. It was amateurish, desperate even, but they did get some modest coverage. By being in the press, they were hoping to gain attention and sympathy in the public's eye, attract new members, and legitima uh, legitimize their cause. Even though Ken's clan here was small, it was sensational. The press would cover them no matter what. Ken explained that the media, in his opinion, had made the cause look bad, and in the process, him as well. But he wouldn't elaborate on exactly how the media made him look bad. It's always someone else's fault, right? I mean, it's not that you're in the Ku Klux Klan or anything. That's not the reason why that the media is slandering you. <laughs> He'd been having trouble with his military command ever since, and his effort to re-enlist was in jeopardy as a result. Fucking duh, dog. It was clear from my phone conversations with Ken. Also, your name's Ken in the Ku Klux Klan. Too many Ks. That he was. Uh, I. It was clear from my phone conversations with Ken that he was angry, but now listening to to him with Chuck, this anger was all the more prominent. There was a distinct. Rage deep in his voice, at once spiteful and sad, that fueled him. What these N-words do needs to be known. Take what happened to Butch's wife, said Ken. Ken stated that Butch's wife had recently been stabbed, and the woman who lived on his street was a suspect in the stabbing. Everyone's a suspect, huh? Jesus. He said someone had burned a cross. And that he said someone in air quotes, so... Vague, not sure. He said someone had burned a cross on this woman's lawn to send her a message, but had done a poor job of it. Ugh, those hate crimes are so gross. 
to do that. The cross burnings, all that shit is so gross. Later, I checked. Uh, later, I checked all police and sheriff departments report databases of this alleged incident, and could find no indication that it, in fact, had occurred. So making stories up to create some sort of emotional connection and be like, yeah, I hate them too, which is unfounded, not true. And just going off of, this is pre Google. So you're not like after the conversation being like, yeah, let me Google that. No, you just like leave. And now you're been downloaded with all this horse shit from this dude that you met at the corner puck pocket bar, whatever the fuck the name of it was. If it had, okay, so later later I checked all the police and sheriff's department report databases on this alleged incident and could find no indication that it in fact had occurred. If it had, then the victim did not report it to the police, which happens. A highly unlikely prospect, though. Ken's voice changed as if expressing some pleasant daydreaming, saying, I'd, le- I'd like to meet whoever was responsible for the burning so I could show him the correct way to burn a cross and also congratulate him. Ken went on to explain that Butch was his bodyguard, but that the clan, collectively, was a non-violent group. Who are you trying to convince? (laughs) He emphasized his point, stating, No form of violence is to be performed unless it's first brought on by a member of the group. What? Yep. What? What? Mm Mm-hmm. Butch, for the first time since arriving at the Corner Pocket Lounge, spoke to Chuck, saying, In public, the clan is to to be referred to as the organization or the cause. He explained his personal anguish at wanting to express himself violently in his relationship um, with um, black people, yet denying himself the opportunity and satisfaction because he was always remembered the the nonviolent policies of the organization. It's hard to hold back sometimes, you know? But the cause is more important. The plans we have will really change the world. Well, I'm certainly interested in joining the organization, said Chuck. Ken told him to open the packet of papers and take out the membership application. Fucking organized so far that you got a membership application. Well, here's here's your, uh, and, and it's in a three ring binder. We usually use these uh, for our newer members. And, yeah, if you just open up there, page one, it'll have our agenda. And, yeah, and that that image there of the KKK was actually done by Butch. And, no, I know that that it might look a little little, uh, amateurish, (laughs) but it was done by Butch. Ken told him to open the packet of papers and take out the membership application. He explained step by step how to fill up the application, including the costs. The fee for the remaining year's dues would be ten dollars. Oh, what would it be? What would that be like? With a full year being thirty dollars. Ah, oh, get it in, you know, year. Saving money when you go the full year. There would also be a fifteen dollar local chapter fee. Ken identified the be- the bank in which the clan held an account and told Chuck it would be necessary to attach a picture with the application. Butch and I are anxious for you to join the organization as soon as possible. If you do, in all likelihood, you and Baron would be going to Denver soon to become sworn members of the group at the same time. Oh, yippee Kai fucking a He explained that once the application process was completed, it generally took 10 days to two weeks to get the membership card returned from the national office in Louisiana. Way too weird of a time frame. So what exactly are the clan's plans in Colorado Springs? Asked Chuck. Cross burnings. Four of them. Where? Asked Chuck. (laughs) We're still planning exactly where, but up on the hills around town, make a real presence. Butch explained that each cross would be 17 feet high by 8 feet wide and assembled days in advance prior to the burning. Several days before the burning... The members would go to the predetermined locations and dig the holes for the placement of the crosses and then cover them up with rocks until ready for use. Okay. 17 feet. That's fucking tall. How big was the monolith? Um, Utah 
monolith and let's do this uh, yeah Three meters tall, so meters to feet, meters to feet. Okay, so it's like nine feet. Okay. Wow, the monolith was 10 feet, 9.8 feet. All right, okay. Still, and that thing was tall, 17 feet high. That's a real statement that you're trying to make. On the night of the burning, the members would go to each selected area, remove the rocks and place the crosses in their respective holes. After dousing the crosses with a flammable solution, a fuse consisting of a lit cigarette, placed on a pack of matches, was timed to ignite within three minutes, allowing for their getaway. All right. I saw that cigarette fuse in a James Bond movie, Ken said proudly. Ah, oh, getting your arson techniques from a movie, dog. <laughs> Smart, said Chuck. <laughs> I smiled at Jimmy when I heard this, he said, uh, Ron said, because they were in the other thing. A couple of 007s we had on our hands. If you get your member... Okay, this is Butch. If you get your membership approved in enough time, you can join us even, said Butch. Ken then continued the narrative regarding the planned activities by telling Chuck they were going to put together a poor white folks Christmas next month. Okay. The members were going to put gift bags of food and other items together for poor white people. All right. N-words said, Ken, look at Christmas as a time to rip off white people. And the Jews look at it as a time to make money off the white population. No one ever looks out for the welfare of white people. So the members are going to do something for poor white, white people at Christmas. <sighs> Ken warned Chuck to never admit having uh, participated. Oh, excuse me, excuse me. Hold on. Ken warned Chuck to never admit having participated in any cross burn burnings and never admit to having participated in any acts of violence. This, he explained, was a policy of the, excuse me, of the organization. When asked what the procedure was for introducing another prospective member into the organization, Ken replied. The first thing to consider was if there was any Jew in the prospective member's background. Good God. If not, if not, then a personal interview, much like this, you know, here at the corner pocket or whatever the fuck this name is, would be arranged. I smiled at Jimmy next to me in the surveillance car as we listened. Chuck was thinking two steps ahead, already wondering how we could get another man in there with him. As you know, in January, David Duke is coming for a rally said Ken. In honor of his visit, the Colorado Springs chapter of the organization was planning a membership march along one of the main downtown streets. The march would be coordinated by the state leader, a Lakewood, Colorado firefighter, eh? Fred Wilkins. The, organizers, the organization's objective for Duke's visit was to have a hundred robed members Cool, go out there in your fucking costumes. Klansmen in white hooded robes, ready to participate in the march in a show of support. In honor and respect of the Grand Wizard. New name, it sounds like Dungeons and Dragons. And to demonstrate that the clan was a viable presence in Colorado. Yo, we out here, the clan. How the fuck am I funny? Yeah. What the fuck is so funny about me? Probably don't, because you're wearing a... A, a robe and a hood and all that shit minus a cape you you're two seconds away from fucking cosplaying ken indicated which is fine if you cosplay fucking cool all good uh not shitting on that at all i know a lot of uh dope ass folks that uh, attend comic con anyway back to our regular programming ken indicated that they if they were able to gather the hundred robed members from the colorado springs chapter by christmas they would possibly be joined by fellow members from Louisiana, because that's super close to Colorado, Kentucky, the metropolitan Denver area, which is the only one that makes sense so far, and several southern Colorado cities, including Pueblo and Cannon City, which is home to the state maximum security prison. It'll really be something, said Ken. After a few more minutes of small talk, Chuck took the packet of papers from Ken with the promises to complete the application process and get it in the mail in the next few days. 
He and Ken agreed to talk further on the subject and walked to Butch's car in the lot where they shook hands and parted ways. When they do that, like when they shook hands, you know, like they're like shaking hands or whatever. And you hear all the, um, like the camera flashes, like the, I just think of movies, you know, when they're like, get them now. And they're just like shaking hands and I can't do it. Like, you know, but if you can tell, you know, I'm shaking hands with myself. Holy Jesus. I know. I'm trying. What is that? I know. What the fuck is that? It was a bad handshake. That's what it was. Butch replied that he did not know. Um, da, 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 da. He and Ken agreed to talk further on the subject and walked to Butch's car in the lot where they shook hands and parted ways. As they rode back, Chuck asked Butch about the member or the number of clan members in Colorado Springs. Butch replied that he did not know and he believed only the state organizer, Fred Wilkins, the firefighter, knew how many uh, were in the Colorado Springs area. He did say that when Chuck got his membership card, it would have on it, uh, on it two letters, CO, which stood for cuck-ass bitch, <laughs> which stood for Colorado, followed by a series of numbers. The first two numbers would be the year and the remaining numbers represented the state membership. Butch further explained that the Colorado Springs clan chapter, as in other cities, was divided into dens, okay, consisting of approximately five members. These were uh, people who, according to Butch, really trusted each other and socialized together after meetings. He expressed his hope that Chuck, once accepted as a member, could belong to their den. Chuck was returned to his car at the Quick Inn parking lot, and Butch promised to telephone him in a few days to make sure he had followed up with the membership application. We had two surveillance cars follow Butch back to the corner pocket lounge, where he picked up Baron and Ken. They followed Butch's truck to a nearby house, the occupants of which were later determined to be a Fort Carson Army couple from Watsonville, California. Chuck, Jimmy, and I returned to the station, where we debriefed. This was solely my inv investigation, says Ron. I did not report to Arthur, who was the lieutenant in charge of the narcotics unit. To Arthur's credit, I did not feel his animosity toward me had anything to do with my race, but instead had everything to do with my boldness. He had, after all, given me my start working undercover, but a year earlier we were working a case that involved the sheriff's department. The sheriff's department uh, presented one plan of action, for the case, an author presented his own. I sided with the sheriff's department because I believed it was a better plan. To Arthur, this was a betrayal, and our relationship had soured since then. The conflict arose because Arthur demanded loyalty at all costs, and I had expressed my independent mind. So that is um, further compounding uh, within the book, because I've read this. Um, the fact that when he first joined, and I'm referring to Ron, that uh, a lot of the folks, he was the first black uh, member of the Colorado Springs Police Department. So um, there was a lot of like, you know, that new integration and um, there were some people that were not taking accustomed to it. So that was that sentence or paragraph rather is further uh, pounding down that point. Like, you know, there were still people that even though this investigation was crazy and it was happening, there were still people that weren't on board. Inside the packet of materials Ken had given Chuck were a couple of copies of the Klan newspaper. And you got publications. The name of the Klan uh, newspaper, can you guess it? It's called The Crusader. What? 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 Let me understand this because I don't you know. Maybe it's me. I'm a little fucked up. Maybe. Yeah. It's called The Crusader. And a membership application. <laughs> oh, man. I completed all the necessary information on the membership application, including filling in my personal data. I also took a photo of Chuck, as required, seated in the office for submission with the application. We cracked a few jokes about saying cheese for the clan. The next day, I obtained $10 of department funds from Sergeant Trapp to apply toward the membership fee and mailed the application to Metairie, Louisiana. National Headquarters of David Dukes, Knights of the Ku Klu Klux, Klux Klan. Just did it right there again. I said Clue. It's important for me to explain just who David Duke was and is. A man whose name to this day is synonymous with hate and a lightning rod in the current political and media landscape. 
a man who would soon consider me a friend. David Duke, you know? Though he held the title of Grand Wizard, David Duke could equally lay claim to being called a public relations wizard. Whoa! He sold his product of a new clan during appearances on the early morning and late night talk shows in time and Newsweek magazine articles. Who the fuck is giving him this type of platform even? Time and Newsweek? In Time and Newsweek magazine articles regarding the transformation of the Klan and in a host of other media publications, including soft porn magazines such as Playboy and We. Dude, We? No, that We magazine. That's what we're going to look up right now, dang. Am I going to be put on the list? Well, I mean, I'm already on, I'm sure, a bunch of them. Oh, it only lasted 12 years. Or no, 12 per year is what they're letting out. We Magazine, let's see, was a men's adult pornographic magazine published in the United States and featuring explicit new. Got it. Okay. I get it. I get it. Oh, ooh, we, 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 we. Look it up. I'm looking on fucking Pinterest right now. Hold on. I'm going to show you guys. Oh, man. This is gold. Look at how funny this is. This is so funny. Hold on. Whoops. Sorry about that. Okay. Look at we. You know? There you go. There's we for you. <laughs> I never heard of we, so I had to go down that rabbit hole real quick. And everyone was with me for it. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. He had uh, appeared in a ton of magazines, David Duke. His appearance was that of an all-American boy every mother would want as a prom date for her daughter. He was always well-groomed. Oh, in the movie, he's uh, played by Topher Grace. If you haven't watched it, you know, uh, more famous for uh, that 70s show, of course, but it's been in several roles since. But in uh, Black Klansman, he is um, uh, played by Topher Grace, which, you know, handsome fella. He was always well-groomed, well-mannered, at least in public, articulate, and highly educated with a master's degree. His Dr. Je uh, Jekyll appearance be, uh, belied a Mr. Hyde personality and perspective on racial matters common, okay, uh, sp racial matters common to the core of America's social and political climate. And that's true. David Duke, if you like, if you look at like YouTube videos of his uh, speeches and stuff, very articulate and um, can converse well and make his points is very succinct. And, um, so yeah, I'm could see why, you know, publicly in a, in a, that eye, he would be like, okay, well, he's not going to slip up and say something super wild. I mean, he ran for offices and he's one, he's won offices, you know, uh, like Senate offices and shit. What did David Duke get? I'm sure he might, uh, go on this, but like David Duke politician, the, yeah, he was a member of the Louisiana House of Representatives. Straight up. David Duke. And, of course, Louisiana, you know. Um, okay. Public, publicly, he would not talk about hate, but about heritage and history. He spawned a new racism for the right-wing masses, one that melded the anti uh, antipathy to blacks and other minorities, to general dissatisfaction with government and fear of an ever-changing complex world. As he stated in a We magazine article, circa 1979, I'm not preaching white supremacy, though he has said he firmly believes whites to be superior to blacks and other minorities. All good, so yes you are. I'm preaching white separatism. I'd like to see all blacks go back to Africa where they belong, but I'd even be willing to give them part of this country, a couple of states, maybe, as long as they have a separate society. Oh my god, David Duke. Duke upgraded his approach to propaganda, you what? know. What? Duke upgraded his approach to propaganda by professionalizing it. He avoided wearing his clan robe in public media appearances. Bad PR move, don't wear that. Preferring a suit and tie instead. Good PR move, do do that. He personally avoided using derogatory epithets um to refer to blacks in public, in particular the word, and you guessed it, what that word is, and encouraged his followers to do the same when representing the Klan and presenting their case to an audience. In essence, he mainstreamed the Klan, if you can even do it, 
he making it seem an acceptable and viable alternative for those looking for a means to express their displeasure with the status quo of their lives and government representatives. In 1979, Duke, who while in college at Louisiana State University was known to be involved in the neo-Nazi movement, was uh, parading around campus wearing Nazi-like uniforms, ran for a Louisiana State Senate seat as a conservative Democrat, and a Democrat, and he won 26% of the vote. In 1988, he did, in fact, run in the Democratic primaries for president, for president, but failed to get on the ticket. Thank We Magazine for that. <laughs> he then sought to gain the nomination from the Populist Party and was successful. Accordingly, he appeared on the ballot for president in 11 states and was a write-in candidate in a few others, which is the same path that a lot of uh, presidential candidates take, um, is uh, being in some states but not being in others. What is that like, though? Is that just like... Um, and I'm not comparing what, you know what? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to just say, ask this question. Uh, is it to the ego at least, is it to get on the ballot? I'm trying to understand that. Like, is that the win is to get on the ballot and be like, okay, well this is a long-term play. So like I got on in 11 States. So maybe in four years I can get on to 22 States, maybe 50% of that, or maybe even just like what? 20% so get on to 13 more states you know um after I don't know there has to be something about the ego like just to be like I'm on the ballot to be the president even though it's not across all 50 you know shortly thereafter he changes political party party affiliation from democratic to republican um yeah in 1989 he ran for he ran for and won a seat as Louisiana State Representative in District 89, which we spoke about. But the following year, he ran unsuccessfully for the Republican nomination for U.S. Senator from Louisiana. Okay, in 1991, Duke ran unsuccessfully for Governor of Louisiana. In 1992, he made another unsuccessful uh, presidential primary run. This time as a Republican. Of course, that was George Bush, uh, who famously lost to Bill Clinton um, in 1992. In 1996, he made another unsuccessful attempt at a U.S. Senate seat. Finally, in the 1999 Special, Ole uh, oh, Special Olympics, just kidding, in the 1999 Special Election to replace U.S. Representative Bob Livingston, Duke ran unsuccessfully as a Republican against David Vitter. Sounds like you lose a lot. Yeah, that's what uh, happened to your unsuccessful runs. Perfect. 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 Uh, okay, it can be argued that all of Duke's campaigns were successful in the sense that they gave him a vast public pa platform. Yeah, all most publicity is good publicity is how they say it, right? So being just in the limelight um, maybe is what he considered a win. Uh, it can be argued that all of Duke's campaigns were successful in the sense that they gave him a vast public platform from which to spout his philosophy and racist ideological agenda. This, in turn, forced his campaign uh, opponents to respond, thus making for an often chaotic outpouring of populist rants in support of Duke and liberal responses against what they perceived to be a neo-Nazi version of Adolf Hitler in a white robe. Wow. Wow. Uh, it made for a lively discussion. Had Duke not been on the ticket in these races much, if not at all, of his topical agenda would probably never have been an issue for debate. The fact that he won an election as a Republican after failing twice as a Democratic candidate says a lot about the mindset of the electorate. Yikes. The conservative right-wing Republican political agenda was then and still is much more in sync with white hate-fueled racist extremist groups like the Ku Klux Klan. Won't disagree super hard on that. The day after the corner pocket lounge meeting, still need a new name for the lounge, I had my first telephone conversation with the Grand Wizard himself. Da -da 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 -da. Very exciting moment. <laughs> meeting with them. Knee deep. Shit. Mm -hmm. You for real? Yeah, yeah, he really did. Yeah. While reading one of the clan 
pamphlets Chuck was given, I noticed an advertisement, an advertisement for the voice of the clan to be reached by calling a Palm Harbor, Florida phone number. When I phoned, I quickly learned that the voice of the clan was, in fact, several pre-recorded messages from various sections of the country expressing KKK propaganda. The messages were typical of white supremacist rhetoric. Wake up, white man! The black man wants your woman and job. The Jew wants your money. The Zionist occupied government wants to take away your citizenship rights guaranteed under the U.S. Constitution and make you slaves to all mud people and their Jewish masters. Your only means of salvation is to join the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, the only group of patriots dedicated to preserving your heritage and rightful place in a white American society. Uh, Zog, who, who is like ingesting that and like actually being like, yeah, fucking a lot of people. That's who I'm like talking to myself now at this point. Like a lot of people are taking that rhetoric in and being like, yeah, I mean, you know, January 20th happened or January 6th. Was it the sixth? Yeah. The, in, the insurrection. Oh my God. And that's so weird on so many levels because everyone that not everyone, but a, a, a fair majority of those that were hemmed up or, you know, like, Oh, Donald Trump turned his back on us and, um, he should be tried because he let, he gave us the green light as it were to go and do those acts. Um, as if they had no, you know, mental capability to make any sort of reasoning out of the matter. Ugh. Zog, which is the Zionist occupied government, just so that we are clear on that. Zog was the typical white supremacist reference to the United States and their belief that it was dominated by and under the control of Jews influenced by the politics of Israel. Mud people was a reference to any, and I'm sure we could have drew this reference, Ron. Thank you, though, for making sure to put it in here. Mud people was a reference to any dark skinned, non-white person they considered under the dominion of Jews. As the expected recorded voice droned on preaching hate, a voice broke in and said, hello. So like midway, like saying like, your only means of salvation is to join the Knights of the Ku Klux. Hello? <laughs> I said, hello, I asked. Who is this? This is David Duke, the actual voice of the clan. He chuckled at this. I have to say I was quite surprised. I'm uh, Ron Stallworth. I'm one of the new chapter members in Colorado Springs. Pleased to meet you. We exchanged pleasantries and I let him know how much I admired his leadership and fearlessness. He responded well to being sucked up to, as most do. Mr. Duke, is it true you're planning a trip in January? Yes, I am. Sometime in January, but we're still working on the exact details. I hope you will be there. I praised him for all the attention and coverage the clan had received under his leadership. And he began to brag about everything he had accomplished. I knew that the key to dealing with someone like Duke, even someone like Ken, who it was clear was far from an intelligent leader, was to praise him, suck up, offer unconditional loyalty. We spoke for about 15 minutes and then he said he had a KKK rally to attend in Palm Harbor that he needed to prepare for. He ended our exchange by stating he hoped to meet me when I was in town. When I got off the phone, I smiled to myself. This was going better than I could have ever planned. Trap and Chuck couldn't believe I was having a conversation with David Duke. One crazy motherfucker, said Chuck. They couldn't believe that I was doing what I was doing and that these idiots were falling for it. They were walking around the department telling everyone, can you believe what this crazy son of a bitch is doing? Talking to David Duke? I felt that the investigation was certainly making a lot of progress. It felt good. Anything that had to do with the Klan, from a newspaper article to a prank call to the department, was now sent to my attention. And it wasn't just me who was aware the Klan was trying to grow their presence in Colorado Springs. The public was also seeing these ads, reading these articles, and becoming agitated. 
The first public counter protest against the emerging KKK presence in Colorado Springs was reported to me the same day as the voice of the Klan exchange with David Duke. The public outcry over the Klan presence came to my office in the form of an intelligence memo stating that blacks and Latinos were planning to commit arson against any cars belonging to KKK members. And this information was determined to be credible. Over the next week, fucking hate fuels hate, man. There's a lot that goes into that, you know? For every action, there's an equal and op- or opposite reaction. It's just gross, man. It's crazy. It's just crazy. Over the next week, word began filtering throughout the public arena that David Duke was going to be in Colorado Springs in January for a media blitz, Krieg. <laughs> See what I did there? Blitz Krieg. Who gives a shit? In January for a media blitz. Um, over the next week, word began filtering through out the public arena that David Duke was going to be in Colorado Springs in January for a media blitz recruitment effort on behalf of the local KKK chapter. Uniform Colorado Springs police department officers responded to a disturbance at the South gate shopping center located on the South end of the city limits. They encountered eight demonstrators peacefully marching in front of stores, carrying placards with anti KKK slogans printed in bold black letters and handing out leaflets. One of the demonstrators I later learned was a professor at Colorado College, um, a prestigious local four-year private school. The leaflet, printed in English and Spanish, was published by INCAR, I-N-C-A-R, the International Committee Against Racism. And it had a Denver P.O. Box address. Are they still in... Uh, are they still doing their thing? In car. Uh, group. There we go. Nope. International community. It was founded in 1973. Once it had been clear that the worker student alliance section of the students for a democratic society could not sustain itself. Okay. Uh, looks like it's, th- yeah, I mean, there's a Facebook group for it. So, okay. So it's still around. Looks like at least. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So this, the leaflet printed in English and Spanish was pr- published by NCAR, the international committee against racism. And it had a Denver PO box address. I later learned of an NCAR meeting planned for that evening and attended in an undercover capacity. This was the start of my co-undercover investigation of the Klan involving the Progressive Labor Party and its front organization, the International Committee Against Racism. The group had been protesting at the mall, was no more than concerned citizens making it known that they wanted no part of a hate group like the Klan being in their town. Big ups to you guys for doing that. I don't know who you are, but big ups. A group like INCAR, sometimes referred to as just CAR, Committee Against Racism, uh, though, posed more of a threat to groups like the Klan and law enforcement. INCAR and its parent organization, the PLP, just so many acronyms, Progressive Labor Party, were extremely radical, organized, and dedicated to their conviction of ultimately smashing the Ku Klux Klan. They were well-planned, on message, and better able to mobilize protest demonstrations to serve their needs. They could turn violent. It's important to remember that this was the 1970s. A period of tremendous political and civil unrest in our nation. Protest bombings in America were commonplace. Especially in hard-hit cities like New York, Chicago, San Francisco. Nearly a dozen radical underground groups dimly remembered outfits such as the Weather Underground, the New World Liberation Front, and the Symbionese Liberation Army set off hundreds of bombs during that tumultuous decade. So many. In fact, that many people all but accepted them as a part of daily life. An in-car representative from Denver, Marianne Gilbert, a Denver University professor, was present at the meeting along with a Denver representative of the Progressive Labor Party, Doug Vaughn. Vaughn identified himself alternately as a representative of both the PLP, Progressive Labor Party, and INCAR. INCAR was the public front 
organization of the PLP. NCAR consisted of average citizens who did not necessarily have any strong political leanings. Just people like a committee against racism, you know, just like, I don't like racism, so this is what I'm doing. The PLP, on the other hand, consisted of the most devout and aggressive politically engaged individuals, the bulk of whom were aligned with the communist ideolo uh, ideology. Doug was communist, but promoted NCAR at every opportunity. I could attend this meeting myself, as they were welcoming to blacks, and I used one of my undercover names. One Ron Stallworth in the clan was enough, <laughs> without another joining the far leftist movement. The purpose of the meeting was to discuss the start of an NCAR chapter in, in Colorado Springs and to plan protest efforts against the KKK and David Duke's upcoming visit to the city. The collective intensity of the public protest against the KKK presence quickly built to include a slew of other alphabet soup organizations. Thank God for saying that. This is not saying like the, the uh, acronym or yeah, the acronyms. Okay. So here goes the list of alph alphabet soup organizations. La Mecca, which is L A M E C H A. Um, they, he doesn't even say what it is. It's just it's Colorado college. BSU, the Black Student Union, which was at Colorado College. La Raza. Um, I need to hit my art on that right. Hold on. La Raza, uh, Colorado Springs. CWUC, Colorado Workers United Council, which was in Denver. The PBP, People for the Betterment of People. People for the Betterment of People, Colorado Springs. And ARC, Anti-Racist Coalition, Colorado Springs as well. Although it was clear that the leftist factions organizing against the Klan were poorly organized, and for the most part nonviolent. I could feel the waters begin to boil in Colorado Springs, and fear and anger build. The KKK was planning burnings, marches, and recruitment. The counterforces, although far less terrorizing, could still lead to possible violence and unrest. My investigation was more important now than ever before, and little did I know that Ron Stallworth, hopeful applicant to the KKK, would be moving up much more quickly in the organization than anyone on my team had planned. And that is chapter four out of the Black Klansman. Again, just the you know true story of one of America's most shocking undercover investigations. Um, and it that. I wanted to read that chapter because it's uh, it's springboards into what he mentioned as the last words there that it just happens so quick. Um, David Duke ends up coming out. He meets him, uh, meets Chuck because right he's not meeting uh, Ron Stallworth in particular. If you've seen the movie, I'm not presenting any spoilers, but I'm not going to do that. Um, watch the movie Black Klansman. It's amazing. Happy Black History Month. Um, and yeah, thank you guys for listening. Short story being on Nate Chacon the third episode 63. One more shout out again. Um, our stories, the new uh, series for the podcast uh, started last week with Brandon Harris. Go back and take a look at that. All the other episodes are there as well on the YouTube channel. Also on all digital streaming platforms, wherever you listen to podcasts. Short story being goes there with you. Shout out to my boy, George Life, Extra T Media. Um, shout out to the top three countries, which I didn't give a shout out to before, which is the United States, Netherlands, and Canada. Um, and then uh, the top three states, um, Florida, Idaho, and Texas. Not much has changed there. Florida is taking the lead by far. So that's where that is. Um, but again, like, follow, subscribe on Twitter and Instagram, uh, extratmedia.com. Visit Libro.fm, start your audiobook journey, get two of them instead of one by using code StoryBingo. Of course, Jaws are size, JawsOrSize.com, StoryBingo, 60% off your order. It's fucking Black Friday every single damn day over there when you use this code. And yeah, we're out of this piece, man. Black Klansman, episode 63. Again, Nate Chicon the third. First time welcome, if not the retention program is working. Thanks for riding with me. And uh, yeah, talk to you guys soon. Dun dun dun! Spare fingers! Yes!